Hey everyone, my name is Chris and welcome to my board game guides. Today, I'm going to do a basic strategy guide for the Settlers of Catan. Now, some of you are probably experts at Settlers of Catan. You know pretty much all the strategic ins and outs of the game. This video isn't really for you. Some of you may have played Settlers maybe five or six times. This video might be a good way for you to assess just how well your strategies that you're currently using line up. And for some of you who have never played Settlers of Catan or maybe only played it once or twice, this video should be helpful because it'll give you some guideposts on how to start winning at Settlers of Catan. Now for those of you who haven't really played Settlers, uh, the goal is to colonize an island by collecting all manners of resources like ore, or wheat, or wood, or brick, or sheep. And in doing so, build these little settlements or cities which can help you collect more resources, uh, which in turn can allow you to buy things like cards, which give you points, and also help you achieve feats like Longest Road, which gives you two points, or Largest Army, which gives you two points, with the goal of getting 10 points. So you'll probably want to ask, what is the best way to get 10 points? How do I trade, wheel, and deal my way to victory? Well, here are some five do's and five don'ts on how to start winning in Settlers of Catan. Tip number one, initial settlements are pretty much everything. So where you place your settlements determines what kind of strategy you'll pursue. If you place it here, you'll get a lot of wood and some brick, which gives you the opportunity to build roads and therefore expand your empire. If you decide to build here, however, you'll be getting some wheat, some ore and some sheep and together all of that will help you in upgrading your settlements to cities so you can get even more resources but whatever you do place it in areas where they'll have numbers that will get rolled more frequently and know that wherever you place them that is where you will then have to think about what strategy you'll pursue during the course of the game, whether it's to expand early or to upgrade your settlements into cities. Tip number two, or actually this is more like tip 1A, is to go for a variety of numbers when you place your initial settlements. So let's look at an example of a placement that doesn't have much variety. Right here and right here. This settlement is on an eight, a three, and it's hard to see, but this is a four. This settlement is on an eight, a four, and a 10. There are four unique numbers here, eight, four, 10, and three. Sure, there's a high probability of eights and fours in general being rolled, but it's very much a feast or famine placement because you'll only get resources if eights, fours, tens, or threes are rolled. And you'll get a lot of resources if eights and fours are rolled. But in doing so, that paints a big target on your back if the rolls are in your favor and people might start sending that robber your way just to take resources from you. Or worse, none of those numbers actually come up and you find yourself in dire straits. What I would recommend instead is to go for a variety of numbers, which means more numbers across the spectrum of the, what is it, um, 11 numbers that can be rolled with uh, two six-sided dice. So 
what I would recommend instead is for you to place here where you'll have access to 6, 9, 3, 8, 4, and 10. Six unique numbers. So that basically helps you to even out the flow of the resources that you'll get in the game and that way give you a much better chance at winning because you'll always be getting resources and it'll be much, much harder to deny you. So tip number two, aim for a variety of resources. Tip number three, find out which resources are scarce. This is especially important because if you can put your settlements on a scarce resource and obtain that resource, then that gives you an advantage because then you can trade aggressively to get that resource. So in this game, there isn't really any resource that's like super scarce, although I would say that maybe bricks and maybe sheep might be a little uh, scarce because you have two tens, a three, and an 11 numbers that generally don't get rolled often. But if you have your settlements placed there it's for some reason, and you're able to procure those resources, then that's great for you because you can then make better deals. You know that if you get a brick, you can become much more aggressive in trading for the resources that you need and make better deals that way so that you can really, really benefit from that. So tip number three, look at the board, try to figure out which resources are scarce and maybe try to corner the market on those so that you can make better trade deals with other people. Tip number four, when you're in the lead, invest in development cards because a lot of development cards will contain knights. Now, if you play Sellers of Catan like I do and a lot of what my group members do, Whenever someone starts taking the lead, the robber will generally be sent into their square. So let's say uh, I'm in the lead right now. Well, they might start sending a robber to block some resources that are in crucial, crucial supply. Well, if you have a knight, like you're supposed to, and you were wise enough to invest in knights, then you can basically threaten people virtually. So you can say, well, you could move your knight to my space, but if you do that, I'm going to sick a knight on you next turn and prevent you from getting resources if those numbers happen to roll up. So getting knights is useful, especially when you're in the lead so that you can defend your own properties. And also it helps th so that you can threaten other people in negotiations so that uh, you can get a better deal or prevent them from wrecking you too much. So number four, if you're in the lead, invest in development cards because you can potentially get knights and they will become extremely useful. And now tip number five. Tip number five, do use the robber wisely. So it's always good to use the robber to target somebody who has the biggest potential to disrupt your plans, especially if that person is in the lead, because then that just gives you a bigger incentive to try to use the robber to deny them resources and stop them from reaching their goals. So basically look at the t uh, board situation to see who can cause you the most trouble or maybe who has a resource that you think is really useful in helping you to achieve your plan, whether it's to build another settlement or another road, and put that robber in that square. One little trick that I've considered using, and that you should also think about using too, is to place the robber on the player who went before you. Why? Because the chances are much higher 
that the robber will stay there. You're threatening the person who is going right uh, before you, which means the robber will probably stay in that square longer because no one will have played a knight to try to push the robber elsewhere. So first and foremost, use the robber to hinder the person who's the biggest threat to you, which is most likely the leader. And also, if you, there needs to be a toss up, stick the robber on the person who is going right before you so that the robber has a much higher chance of staying in the hex where you placed it. So that's it. The five do's for Settlers of Catan. All right, now we're gonna move to the five don'ts, stuff that you should not be doing when you're playing Settlers of Catan, because all of these will decrease your chances of winning if you ever engage in them. First and foremost, don't number one, do not trade with the leader, because if you're trading with somebody, the idea is that both players will benefit to some degree, but if you're trading with the leader, the leader will benefit and that will most likely allow the leader to get closer to winning the game. Now in the early game, that might not matter so much, but definitely in the late game, do, do not hesitate to launch an embargo against the player who is in front and make sure that you do not trade with that player. Tip number two for the dunks. And this should really, really be self-explanatory, but do not forget to look at the game board and calculate how many points that player might have. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that player has two knights that are already revealed and he's holding one more development card. This development card could easily be another knight or it could be a harmless road building or maybe harmful road building. You don't know. All that you know is that that person is one knight away from getting the largest army card, which gives them two points. So if you see somebody with seven points and they have two knights out, be prepared because they might actually have nine points and just be really, really close to winning, but they just don't want to tip their hand just yet. Likewise, check their board to make sure that there is no possibility that they might take a uh, longest road because again, that's, that's another two points. And if they have uh, six, seven points, and they're just actually one card away from building another road, they might actually just have nine points. And that would be a much tougher situation for you to deal with. So for our next don't to don't number three, it's kind of an extension of don't number two. But don't number three is if it is economically feasible, like you have resources that you can spare, do not neglect to defend your special achievements. Why is that? Because the differences in scoring with these achievements can be a really big tipping point. Because let's say you're not constantly making sure that you have the longest road. Well, if somebody manages to steal longest road from you, it's not a two point difference. It's a four point difference. Somebody is getting two points while you're losing two points. So that's a four point swing and that can be very, very dangerous, especially if it puts them closer to winning. Same thing with knights. If somebody else is trying to gun for knights as well, make sure, you, and you have this largest army card, Make sure you're doing as much as you can to defend it 
assuming, of course, that it is economically feasible because you don't want to give away a strong position just to defend it. But if you can, you should because two points, that's 20% closer to winning than you were previously. So that's my tip. If you have these special achievements, don't forget to defend them. Tip number four. When you build some roads into an area, don't forget to make sure that you can at least build a settlement there. If not on that turn, then on a turn that is that comes up shortly after. And the reason for that is I've seen a lot of games, at least with beginners, where they build out a road, they're ready to build a settlement, except the settlement takes about two or three turns to actually come out because of resources. And then by the time it gets back to their turn, they don't have that, uh, that spot is no longer a valid spot in which to build a, settle to build a settlement because somebody else might have just taken it. So if you're gonna build a road, it is usually, usually a good idea to make sure that you don't forget to build a settlement immediately or at least one turn thereafter. Because the possibility of somebody stealing that spot from you is just too high and you've already put in too much work for them to be able to just take it just like that. Finally, tip number five. Don't forget to take advantage of these, or these, or these. That's right, I'm talking about ports. As you go towards the end of the game, especially if you're in the lead, people will be doing things like using the robber to take stuff from you, playing the Monopoly card, or just placing the robber in some place that will deny you a precious resource. Having these ports available to you gives you much more options so that you can be self-sufficient. So if somebody blocks you, hey, use the port to trade for what you need to buy whatever it is that you need to win the game. After all, people will be doing all kinds of things to uh, prevent you from winning. They'll be using all sorts of strategies, they'll stop trading with you. So by the end of the game, you'll need to be self-sufficient. And the best way to be self-sufficient is to take advantage of the ports. So that's it, folks. My five do's and don'ts for the Sellers of Catan. Now, for those of you who are really well-experienced players, what kind of strategies do you use to win at Settlers? Do you have some sort of trading strategy? Do you have some sort of jerk strategy like give them all my wheat and then use the Monopoly card to take it back? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're interested in seeing more strategy videos, please subscribe to this channel. And I look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Have a great day, folks. Bye-bye.